we're going to read scripture first, but I do want to let you know that um, be praying for the Jerry Winninger and his family, Carlina and others. Jerry is very close to exiting this life and entering into the next. So possibly within the next 24 hours. So keep him and the family, especially in your prayers for this. All right. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we've seen a high view of God, a high view of Scripture. Today we're looking at a high view of Christ. Let me read this, these verses here. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's still there today. So let's pray. Father, we praise and thank you for all of these great songs that we've been able to sing this morning to lift you up, Father, to cause our hearts to worship and praise you. We thank you for who you are and your great plan for us, for, for your people. And Lord, we do uh, pray for Jerry as he's in his, definitely in his last days here, last hours perhaps. We pray that you'll give him comfort in his heart if he could be thinking about anything there in his room. And we pray for Carlina and, and uh, the, Tasha and her brother and the family. Lord, be with them. Encourage their hearts uh, these days right now, these hours. And Lord, we uh, pray for your people here as a church. We pray for those who are going to be leaving this today to spend a week at camp. Lord, we pray that that'll be a rich and great time. People will, kids will come to know you and to love you and be with those who are in charge and leading this uh, summer camp. Thank you that the weather seems to be going to be cooler for them. We pray for them. Thank you for... Uh, our country. We pray for those in authority. We pray that you would bring about great revival in our land, Lord. Pray for those who are, have evil intents, that you would put them down, that you would raise up men who have, and women who, who love you especially, and who have love for our land. We pray for our missionaries. Thank you for them. Pray that you'll encourage their hearts as they go through these days, Father. And now we commit our time to you as in Jesus' name, amen. In a recent journal article entitled, Veiled in Flesh, the Godhead See. That's from the Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Veiled in Flesh, the Godhead See. Mike Riccardi from Master Seminary wrote the following, and I'm quoting him here. Among all the works Almighty God has accomplished, the incarnation has a special luster of magnificence. The juxtaposition of the majesty of the infinite God with the humility of finite man, united in one magnificent person, renders the glory of the incarnation more especially brilliant than all other of God's glorious works. Therefore, God's people must devote their minds to the study of this wonder. We must peer into this mystery with the hope of inflaming our hearts with the worship that God rightly deserves. I wish you could read that over and over again. It's in the, a journal article. Great words. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. And this is what we're wanting to do this morning. We want to get a high view of God. We want to peer into this mystery of Christ. It took the early church several hundred years to figure out exactly how that man of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, could also be God. The Arians, 
in the early centuries said he was a great man, but not God. Others said he was God, but not fully man. Still others, the Gnostics, said he really wasn't there as a man. He just looked like he was there. He was a phantom. And still others said he was a mixture of God and man, kind of like scrambled eggs. Two natures scrambled into one nature, a third nature. So in 451 A.D. at the Council of Chalcedon, many, many fathers of the church there gathered to settle the confusion about the man Christ Jesus. And they formulated the doctrine of, and this will be on the test, so you might want to write it down, the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union, that is that the, the incarnate Christ, God in a body, Christ in a body, the incarnate Christ in one person and two natures, human and divine. One person, two natures, human and divine, without confusion, without change. This is all in the, the uh, creed there from the Council of Chalcedon. Without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. In other words, Jesus, through his incarnation, was truly God and truly man. Mike Riccardi added in his article, we ought to bow in wonder before the wisdom of the divine mind that conceives such a peculiarly glorious miracle as the incarnation. It's worthy of consideration. And of course, the Chalcedon Creed didn't end the heresies about Christ to this very day. The Jehovah's Witnesses, much like the Arians, claim that he was the first created being. He's not really the God. The modalists, like T.D. Jake, the United Pentecostals, say he is the same person as the Father and the Spirit. There's just one, and they appear in different modes. That's called modalism. We'll put that on a test, too. So you might write that down. Many say, even today, that he was a good man, but not God. Some say that it was all a myth. He never really existed, or as Islam claims, strangely, they do believe in his virgin birth and so on, but that he was a prophet. He didn't die on the cross. He was just a prophet like Muhammad. And the Mormons say Jesus is not eternal God, but was procreated as the first spirit child of the Father, and other people become spirit children of the Father, but he was the first. So the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the second person of the triune God, co-equal, co-eternal, with the Father, and that through the miracle of the virgin conception, I like that better than the virgin birth. It was a virgin conception. It was a virgin birth, but it was a virgin conception. He became a man. He remained deity, but took on human flesh. He remained what he was, but became what he was not. He remained God, but he became flesh. And this is certainly the greatest miracle and mystery of all time. No wonder Charles Wesley said, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. It's a great song, great theology there. Now, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1 here, these three verses. This is a great passage on the su supremacy of Jesus Christ. But I want to look... First of all, very briefly, what, he, what the author says as he gets started here, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his son. 
God has spoken, number one. That's Hebrews chapter one. That's on the surface. God is a communicating God. He has revealed his mind to us in the scripture. But he also spoke in days past in the Old Testament times in various ways and in, in various portions, it says. Sometimes he spoke directly. Where are you, Adam? To Noah, he said, build an ark. To Moses, he said, take your shoes off. He spoke through dreams and visions. He carved letters on stone up on Mount Sinai. He even spoke through a donkey, you may recall that. And then he spoke through all the prophets, all in harmony with one another, all pointing forward to something, all pointing forward to someone. All 39 books of the Old Testament are without error, infallible, like we said last week, but they aren't complete. God has a final message. If you've ever been to a synagogue service, that's the biggest thing that hits you. They don't have the New Testament. It's not complete. Why are you even meeting? It's all tradition. God has a final message, a final word, and that word, as he says there in verse 1, I'm sorry, in verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. That final word is none less than Jesus Christ for these last days. That's what it says. And we are living in the last days. We've been in the last days ever since Christ came the first time. So, if you want to hear from God today, you listen to Jesus Christ. You have to hear him. He came to reveal the Father, John 1, 18. He came as God's final, complete, supreme, heart-satisfying message for sinners above all other voices and messages in this world. You need to hear Jesus Christ. Now, God gives us this amazing description of his son in these two verses, verses Hebrews 1, 2, and 3. There's nothing in Scripture more amazing and awesome about Christ than these seven descriptions that we're going to look at this morning. So let's look at them, and in our hearts we praise God, just like we did as we were singing these songs. First of all, Jesus Christ is God's predestined heir of all things, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now, I'm sure you know that life is not all about you. We heard about narcissism this morning. Life is not all about you. It's not all about Joe Biden. It's not all about even Donald Trump. Life is all about Jesus Christ. And in eternity past, in eternity past, before the sun blazed with light and the oceans teemed with fish, before birds dazzled us with those murmurations, which I love to watch, God had an eternal love relationship in eternity past with his son, his only begotten son. And almighty God had it on his heart from those endless ages to honor and exalt his son. And he made him heir of all things. He planned and designed all things for the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. All things. Yes, it would be through the incarnation when his Son would come into the world of sin and shame and endure the mockery and spit and pain and the cross where he would suffer the wrath of God's offended glory for sinners like us. God planned, determined, predestined in his eternal counsel that his son would be the heir of the entire universe. The universe isn't just spinning on mindlessly without purpose. Christ is the heir, his, God's only begotten son. By submitting to the Father, 
as the lamb slain for sinners, he would inherit the universe as the God-man. Not without suffering first. First suffering, then glory. Think about this heir of the universe. He hung naked on a Roman cross. He who shall be crowned Lord and King of all was crowned with thorns. His hands, destined to hold the scepter of universal sovereignty, were nailed to a cross piece of wood. His feet, appointed to tread over all his enemies, were fastened to the upright section of that cross. He before whom every knee will bow, the God-man, Jesus Christ, he before whom every knee shall bow knelt and washed the feet of sinners. He who has the power to shake the heavens allowed soldiers to spit on him, punch him, slap him, beat him with a stick, and ridicule him, and finally crucify him. First the cross, then the crown. And we see this in Revelation 5. In Revelation 5, we're not going to turn there, but... In Revelation 5, there's a book, there's a scroll. Who is worthy to open this book? And this book is the title deed to the earth and probably the universe, since everything happens on earth in this universe. And no one was found, and John is weeping until someone said, stop weeping. There is one who is worthy, and that worthy one was the lamb who was slain. He is worthy to open the book. And he did just that. And we see it in the book of Revelation as it unfolds as the, the, in the tribulation period. So God predestined the Son to inherit all things. That includes everything, Mars, Neptune, Jupiter, whatever else is out there, all of it. Now, the reality is, and we're not going there this morning, but you and I as believers in him are joint heirs with him. So somehow we're going to be ruling with him, not only in the millennium, but even into the eternity future. Joint heirs, but that's another sermon. Secondly, Jesus Christ is God's means of bringing all time and space into existence. Through whom also he made the world. Now, that word world is not the word cosmos. It's the word ion, and it's plural, ionos. That means ages. It's more than the physical universe. It's time and space, all created things throughout history. It's in Hebrews 11.3. The ages were framed by the word of God. Christ is God's chief architect, administrator of the entire universe. Nothing happens by chance. All the world's ages have meaning, purpose. Christ's fingerprints are over all of it. This is why Daniel can prophesy about four coming empires. How could he do that? Well, Christ is the one who designed those empires. He is the creator of physical and time, history. John 1, 1 through 3 harmonizes with this perfectly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He is the creator of all things. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. By him through him, for him, in him. 
Jesus Christ, the God-man, incarnate through the Virgin Mary. And so he's the answer to all these, and I've got these four questions that I learned many, many years ago, but how do you get something from nothing? You don't. Christ created the universe out of nothing, ex nihilo. How do you get life from non-life? You don't. Christ created all the living things. How do you get higher forms from lower forms? You don't. Christ made everything according to its kind. How do you get man from animal? You don't. Christ made Adam from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. By him, through him, for him, in him, and now everything holds together. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. Number three, Jesus Christ is the outshining radiance of God's glory. He is the radiance of his glory. This word radiance is a fascinating word, and you could translate it the outbursting of God's glory. You could translate it the effulgence, the radiant splendor of God's glory. He is the radiance of his glory. Two months before he went to be with Jesus, in October of 2017, he R.C. Sproul preached a sermon on this passage, which I've listened to several times. When he got to this portion, he drew back, and he said this. He said, quote, I hesitate to comment on this. It is so blessed, so provocative. It is one of the most holy texts about Christ. The title of that sermon, if you want to listen to it, and I recommend it to you, is called The Brightness of Glory. That was in October of 2017. He died in December. The word radiance, outshining, radiating. Remember the Shekinah glory? It was was a cloud, but it was also bright. This is something of the glory of God. And when Moses saw the backside of God or when he went and talked with God, his face would shine with, with this glory was on his face but it was all reflected like the moon. The moon doesn't have its own light. The moon just reflects the light of the sun, right? Christ is himself the outshining of God's glory. When Christ was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, his, his garments became white, brilliantly white, and it says in Matthew, I believe it is, that his face shone like the sun. Just imagine that. His face, and these three disciples witnessed this. John said, we saw his glory. They saw Christ's divine nature when he changed water water to wine. He quieted the roaring waves. Men don't do these things. He fed and healed multitudes. He is the God-man, fully God and fully man. All that God is, Christ is. And the glory wasn't reflected on Christ. The glory was in Christ, and at certain times it flashed forth. He came as a man, his deity. He didn't, by the way, he didn't lay aside his deity. That's from Philippians chapter 2. His deity was veiled. That's what Charles Wesley is saying there. In flesh, the Godhead, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. He didn't lay aside. He he was always all-knowing and all-powerful. He just veiled it according to the Father's will. Luke 21, 27 says he's coming again with power and great glory. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. I mean, we're going to be raptured. We're going to be with him. Then he's going to come back. 
Revelation 19, with power and great glory and take immediate, direct, personal rulership of this world. That's going to be an exciting time. If you're a Christian, you're going to be with him. You ready to rule with Christ for a thousand years? That'll be an amazing time. Not like the rulers of our day. In an amazing way, and I added this, this is a sort of another sermon, but I want you to see this. When the gospel comes into your heart and mind, when the gospel comes into a human being's heart, the glory of Christ somehow comes into your life. Let me just read this. This is a few verses from 2 Corinthians. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God said, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What does that all mean? I don't know. But it's amazing. Somehow believers have the glory of God in their lives, reflecting. And when your life changes, you're reflecting the glory of God. This is huge stuff. It's like, I mean, this whole passage here in Hebrews is like, putting the whole ocean in a thimble. We can't really grasp it all, but we can sure have a good time trying to understand as much as we can. He is so glorious and supreme, who can fathom him? Okay, number four, number four. Jesus Christ not only is the outflashing of God's glory, he is the exact representation of God's essence. He is the exact representation of his nature. Christ is equal in every way to the essence of God's nature. He is eternally coexistent of the same essence, having the same attributes as the Father. Is the Father omnipotent? So is Christ. Is the Father omnipresent? So is Christ. How did Christ know there was a gold coin in that fish's mouth how did christ know there was a cult over there in that city how did he know that humans don't know what's just a little bit up the road here is he righteous and just and wise loving and merciful and good so is christ when philip asked jesus to show us the father he said you see me you see what the father it's amazing that's what Jesus said. The word exact representation is our, well, the Greek word is character, and we see the word character in it. That's what the word is. But it has the idea of something like a type. Remember, remember when typewriters roamed the earth? And they were clacking in every office. And when the type, when that key struck the ribbon and then the paper, it left its mark. And Apparently, I read this, but forensic experts, when there was a crime and there was a paper involved, they would study the imprint of the, the type of the letter, and then they would go looking for, I don't know how this works, but they would go looking for the typewriter that had that exact same imprint okay. so that they could see where did that paper come from. We don't do that today. We have other means. Well, if you take Christ, he is the exact same character as God's essence. If you're going to find an exact match for Jesus Christ, it's going to lead you directly not to an angel or another man but it's going to lead you directly to Jesus Christ. He is of the same essence as the Father. So all God is, 
Jesus is. He is the eternal I am. Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, sovereign, perfectly holy, the judge of all flesh. That's why he said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. You can't get to the Father through Christian science Jesus or the Jehovah's Witness Jesus or the Mormons Jesus or the Islamic Jesus or the Unitarian Universalist Jesus because they think he's just a man. All of those deny the exact representation of God in Jesus Christ. Number five. Number five. And I'm right on time here. You'll see why. Jesus Christ sustains and directs all of life. Look what it says here. And he upholds all things by the word of his power, by his powerful word. We could say by his omnipotent word. Upholds. That's a present tense. That means right now. Right now at 11, I had down 1115. It's 1114 in case you're wondering. July 24th, 2022, Jesus is presently upholding, carrying the whole universe, including you and me, from the last moment to this next moment, and then this next, he's carrying us. Fate doesn't rule. Christ rules, and he is literally bearing us along providentially guiding everything in this universe, everything to its divinely ordained destiny. That means you don't have to spend one moment worrying about climate change. When Jesus wants the climate to change, he'll change it. Praise the Lord, he's changing it tomorrow. Don't worry about the oceans rising. Really, those environmentalists aren't worried about it either. They just want us to be afraid. Colossians 1.17 says he is holding it all together. A news item this week, you may have seen it, warned us. Ooh, they love to warn us. Warned us with the possibility, if Neptune was nudged just 0.1% out of its orbit, it would destabilize the entire solar system. And then there's a 1% chance that Mercury might crash into Venus within the next 5 billion years. I spent 5 billionth of a nanosecond worrying about all that. They love to scare us. I think they're in cahoots with the ibuprofen people or the headache people or whatever. The... So Jesus Christ bears all things by his power. You know, the laws of nature are not autonomous. They are Christ's laws. He upholds or sustains it all. You know, he said... You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, don't be afraid, fear not. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is one reason why he's in charge. I think this is why Paul said, in everything give thanks. Why? Because Jesus is in charge and he's bearing all things by his power. He's upholding you. By his power. All right, number six. Number six. So we, he's the heir of all. He's the creator of all, both matter and history. He is the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact identification with deity. And he bears all things. Number six, Jesus Christ is the one final sacrifice for sins for all times. Look what it says. When he had made purification for sins. Hang on when he had made purification for sins. Why did Christ come into the world? 
Why did he, was he virgin conceived, the God man? Why did he come? Did he come to reform a world of depraved people? No. He didn't come to give the world even a good example, although he certainly is the, the perfect example. He didn't come to tr- help people try to cope with all their problems and everything. He came for one reason, 1 Timothy 1.15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world. Why? To save sinners. That is why he came. He's coming back the second time to set up his kingdom. But he came the first time to save sinners of whom I am chief, said Paul. Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man, and this is Jesus talking, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When he had made purification for sin. Let's just think about that for a couple of moments. It doesn't say he will make purification for sin. It says he made purification for sin. It's a done deal. He said, it is finished on the cross. Remember that? It is finished. This is why Hebrews, over and over, Hebrews 9, 26. Now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He came as the final sacrifice. He is the true Passover, right? He is the true scapegoat. He is the true mercy seat, if you know your Old Testament. All fulfilled in him. He is our great high priest. He laid down his life on that cross for sinners. He removed our guilt and satisfied God's holy justice, making purification for sin. He, f- he fulfilled all the Old Testament pictures and symbols of purification. Now, listen to this. He came to save sinners. We read that, right? He came to save sinners. Let me add this. And he will save all the sinners he came to save. He wasn't on a fool's errand on that cross, hoping that people would believe in him. No, 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 no. And we're going to see more of this next week the high view of the gospel. He came to save sinners, and he's going to save all the people he came to save. All that the Father gives me, Jesus said, shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 37, beautiful. And then finally, Jesus Christ is now exalted to the position of, of highest honor, we could say, in the universe. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I do believe that there's a progression here. It starts off with he is the heir of all things. That was in the eternal council. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Son would be the heir of all things. And here we end up, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. After he accomplished his mission... In the world, after he once for all made purification for all the sins of all the people who would believe in him, that would be his elect. After he cried out, it is finished, and then he rose from the grave, he returned home as the victorious God-man. I I think when he ascended, remember they were out there on the mount, and the disciples were watching him go, and he ascended, and... I don't know how that worked. I don't know, but he came into, he came home. He came into heaven. And you know, you just have to believe that the angels, it just was this reverberation of praise. Our, our warrior who overcame sin and death and the devil, he's victorious. And he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 10, 12 He, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And believe it or not, we're going to sit with him. Revelation 3.21, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That is amazing. 
The right hand of the majesty on high. That's exactly where Christ is today, much to the dismay of Satan and his demons. If only the world understood that. If only the world, all of these elitists, if only they understood that. He sits there as our great prophet, as our great high priest, and as our great king. One of these days, when the word is given, he's going to return. He's going to come for his church, the rapture, and then he's going to come back to the earth and set up that glorious kingdom, the absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ. So what do we do with all this? So what? Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When you start thinking about yourself too much, you get that narcissistic thing we heard about in Sunday school. Or when you start worrying about all that's going on in this world, and if, if there wasn't a God-man at the right hand of God, we'd have plenty to worry about. We wouldn't know where we're going. If you're all anxious about why things are going wrong for you, maybe, here's a word of counsel for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you've never had your sins removed, your guilt dissolved, there's plenty of cleansing power in the blood of Jesus. You need to go to him in prayer, seek his face, ask him to cleanse you of your sin. Let's pray. Dear Lord, what a glorious Savior we have the God-man, very God and very man. Two natures, one person, mystery of mysteries. Help us to realize what an incredible reality he is. Help us to keep our eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. In his name I pray, amen. Amen. Please stand as we finish. Mm -hmm.